um, there was a time in, in, in Puerto Rico where, you know, I'm standing waiting for the bad guy and I'm with my backup agent and she looks and she goes, Hey, that van just opened the door and they're, you know, they're like circling us and it's full of dudes that look like they don't, they're not very happy. So I was like, Hmm. So we stood there. Soon as I made eye contact with one, I got in a car. We pulled out of where we were, and then all of a sudden, they start forming in behind us. So we're in in San Juan. I'm trying to lose them in like in traffic. So I'm trying to like play with the lights, um, and uh, eventually we're able to make it into a mall parking lot. We got far enough ahead that we were able to dump the car. And then we ran into the mall, called our backup team and said, okay, this is where we are. You guys need to get us. And you guys need to get here quick. Okay, can you introduce yourself for me, please? Hi, aloha. My name is uh, John Tolan. I am the special agent in charge for Homeland Security Investigations in Honolulu, Hawaii. And John, can you tell me, give me a little bit of idea about uh, growing up, your family life, and was there anything as you were growing up that led you to law enforcement? So um, I grew up in Jackson Heights, Queens, which is a uh, overwhelmingly immigrant community. I came to the U.S. as a child at, uh, at nine years old. Um, Raised by a single mom, working, you know, odd jobs and, and mostly at night. Uh, ultimately, she landed a job, a pretty steady job, union job, cleaning offices in, in the city in Manhattan. Um, and, you know, just that type of uh, living up in a, in a pretty tough neighborhood. I had not one, but two crack houses uh, in the building that I, that I grew up in. Um, at the age of 13, I was speaking with uh, the, the owner of the building because my mom didn't speak good English. So I had to do all of the interaction whenever we needed anything done in the apartment. Um, and we wanted the apartment painted. So one of the crack dealers saw that I was speaking to the, to the building manager and he immediately confronts me as to what my conversation was about. And I was like, I need my apartment painted. If you want to come up and see, it doesn't look that great. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, th that, that was sort of my, uh, my, you know, my childhood, my growing up there, uh, lived in that same place, um, actually right until, right until right before I graduated college. And was there anything growing up that led you to law enforcement that made you want to go into it? Not necessarily growing up, uh, so I was a, an average, below average student. I graduated high school with a C average, with a 75 average. Um, I was fortunate enough to graduate from a New York City public school, which meant that the City University of New York had to take me. Uh, they didn't have a choice. Everybody with a with a uh, high school diploma from from a, from a city uh, from a city high school gets into the City University of New York. Um, I graduated high school. I didn't apply to college right away. I took six months off to find myself. Um, during that summer, I was dating uh, a girl who she had she had big dreams. So she was already enrolled, and you know she was she was a go getter. Uh, and I was kind of like dragging her behind. Right? Um, she uh, we were at her house one summer. And it was the summer of the Anita Hill hearings. And so we're at her house. Her parents were, were out of the house. We were, had, we just had lunch. We were watching TV and I see the, the Anita Hill hearings. And I start watching it. And this is when the agents are testifying about their investigation, what they found, who they spoke with, how they, you know, they interviewed the witnesses and they're talking to the, to the Judiciary Committee about this. And I was fascinated. I didn't know why. I don't come from a law enforcement family, not anti-law enforcement by any stretch, but, you know, that wasn't the world I grew up in, right? I grew up in, in, in a very 
you know, kind of a tough neighborhood where probably I should have been the head of a criminal organization rather than doing what I do now, which is, uh, which is kind of odd. Um, but something about that drew me. Something about the investigation, something about the professionalism, something about the finding of truth. And so I started watching and I was fascinated. My girlfriend at the time fell asleep next to me. And she says, you know what? I'm going to go take a nap. You're going to keep on watching this? I said, yes, this is fascinating. How could you be asleep? She woke up a couple of hours later. I was still watching the hearings. And so she turns to me. She goes, you know, if this is so interesting, maybe this is what you need to do. Uh, And I was like, well, you know what? Let me see. And there is a college, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, which is part of the City University of New York, which specializes in criminal justice. And so from her house, from the the, the phone that was on the wall in her kitchen, I called because at the, you know, back then you had to call to request an application. So they sent me an application. I filled out the application um, and they accepted me because they had to. Um, and that was it, right? That, that's what, that's the pivotal moment. I always think back to that, you know, to that particular moment. And, um, even though, look, you know, you, there's, you can say what, you know, that, that there's controversy and to whether or not the hearings got to the truth. Um, that was also a lesson that I learned. I said, look, sometimes you do your job and, we don't do our job to get a particular result. We get a, we do our job to present our findings and leave it to other people because that is our job. Our job is to find the information, not necessarily to interpret what we find one way or another. So in 94, you become an intern as an import specialist. How do you fall into that position or how do you get to that position? So once I started at John Jay, I went from a graduating high school with a C average to being straight A student. Wow. Because I loved it. Loved it. I ate everything up. I had found my calling. Uh, I wanted to really excel. And so one of the first things that I did after my first semester was I found the internship office at John Jay College. Um, And oddly enough, I am still in touch with the director of that office. I still email her you know, to this day, um, her name is Prem, and she's, she's, she's somebody who really I, I, I'm very grateful for because she opened that door. I went and I said, look, I, I want to try an internship. She says, well, come back when you have 30 credits. These are, your, these are the minimum requirements. If you meet the minimum requirements, if you have your 30 credits, then we will go ahead and we will uh, enroll you in the program and we'll get you an internship. And so my first internship was with, with the New York City Department of Investigation, with uh, the, uh, the New York City EPA. And it was not criminal investigators, but they do a lot of fraud investigations and, you know, really great people. And I enjoyed being around them, right? And they let me sort of peek in to see what investigators did. And I was like, oh, this is great. Did that. And then... Um, for the next round, once that semester was over, I said, look, I wanted to do you know, another internship. I said, well, you did one, you had, you know, your, your grades were good and, you know, the review was good and everything else. So um, we have this internship with U.S. Customs, with the Intel division. It's federal. So you're going to have to, you know, meet some more stringent requirements. Are you willing to do it? I said, absolutely. Um, and so I started that internship. That internship, the boss of that internship, I still keep in touch with as well. <laughs> to this day, I, you know, we're, 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 you know, we, we still, I still speak to him. Um, again, just because of, of the amount of uh, the foundational importance, right? Like, I'm very grateful that he was, you know, that he, he was such a he was such a great boss, and that um, he really was central to me saying yes. I think I do want to go federal. Um, and then after that internship, I had already gotten a background investigation. And so they opened up this paid internship. So I just saw this because I'm going through my retirement, like paperwork, like to prepare to retire. Right. Um, 
So my salary was seventeen thousand dollars a year as a GS four step one or something like that. Um, and so they opened up this internship, and um, I had already been with part of U.S. Customs. They had somebody in the building that knew me, and I had already already had the clearance. So when the school sent me for the interview, they they said, "Yeah, you're you're great because you know you have the right references, your grades are good, and you're already clear, which means you can start Monday." So that was it. That was it, and, and I haven't left since. <laughs> So before we talk a little bit about your career, I want to ask you, because you would be considered legacy customs, I guess is the, is the term. If you cut me, I'd, be, I'd leave blue. <laughs> so what, what is the difference between what you did with customs when you guys got basically created into Homeland Security? Is there, do you have any different, different jobs or is it kind of the same? They just changed their name. No. The the job changed dramatically. Okay. Um, I think the it, the job became more focused on really identifying large criminal organizations. And we were given special tools, right? So tools that we did not have before. Mm. Um, and and so learning how to integrate those tools into what we had been doing for so many years uh, was a challenge. And the other thing is when you take two organizations that have separate um, cultures and you try to combine those two cultures um, in the manner that it was done, they, you know, it, it was uh, a little bit of oil and water. At the beginning. So, John, can you explain to the audience when you say – uh, combining two cultures, two agencies. What what were those that formed ultimately ended forming HSI? So we had we they uh, they took elements of that came from the Department of the Treasury, which is U.S. Customs, part of the United States Customs Service, and elements from the Department of Justice and the Immigration and Naturalization Naturalization Service. And really, overnight, we were told talk amongst each other. That was really, there was no, it, it was, it was a rough start. Um, I think it, it, it was as a, re, you know, the reaction to 9-11 and sort of the way the department came together. Um, and this has been documented in, in, in books and, you know, in, in, in many different ways in terms of how the agencies came into the HS and, and how the, the, everything came together. But the human portion of it, um, was difficult. Um, I think there was also um, the way the agencies ran, the way the the uh, the investigations were structured. There were some very very significant not not just cultural differences, but actually um, structural and and, and and differences in, in guidance, differences in authorities that took a, a fair amount of time to to really. Um, smooth out amongst everybody that was, you know, that, that was part of it. Yeah. So one question I've always been interested in is HSI, you guys work on a lot of stuff and FBI works on a lot of stuff. And I kind of see you guys as similar agencies in respect that you can work on a whole bunch of different things. Is there something that HSI works on that FBI can't or vice versa? I think we, you know, there's few, a couple of authorities that are designated for, for FBI, a couple of authorities that are designated for, for HSI, um, that change the way we work. So, for instance, we're customs officers, and as a result, we have border search authority. FBI does not. But FBI is recognized as the lead agency on terrorism. So it doesn't mean we don't work terrorism investigations. It just means that it has to be coordinated. Um, I think we we are, uh, I think the focus, and, and this is all really done for the purposes of not necessarily saying legally you cannot work this or you cannot work the other. It's really to, to make sure that we are, uh, and we have each other's back in, in a lot of ways. So we do things 
we spend more time doing things that they don't because they spend things, you know, time doing things that we don't. Right. So to, to make it more of a complementary um, partnership and relationship uh, between the agencies, um, our authorities are pretty similar, are incredibly similar. Yeah. Um, you know, I will say that you know, being legacy customs, our authorities are older. So we predate the FBI. So I will take that. <laughs> I will say that. Yeah. Uh, we go back to 1789. And so, um, you know, it, it, it really is in terms of where people have, um, uh, there, there, there has been a decision made in terms of policy of what tracks the FBI will follow. Um, you know, the, the, the FBI, for instance, gets involved with, you know, murder investigations at the state level. We don't. Yeah. Right. Our focus are at the policy level. We said that we don't. You know, that's not something that uh, we necessarily have the manpower or want to be involved in. Yeah. I just always found that interesting. <clears throat> I, I never really knew the answer to that. So. Okay. So in '97, you start as a I'm assuming a special agent with Customs in Seattle. How old are you at that time? Twenty three years old. Twenty three. So how is that? 23 years old, you become a special agent, you're in Seattle. What are you working on and, and how are you feeling at that point? I'll be honest with you. Uh, in terms of being a special agent at 23 is a dream come true. It's winning the lottery, right? Like I stopped playing the lottery when I got this job. I tell people, um, I'm not a fan of Seattle though. So as soon as I got to Seattle, I just wanted to get out of Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what were you working on though for the, for the little bit that you were there? So um, I worked a lot, um, mostly drugs, actually. It was, you know, a lot of drug cases, um, worked at the airport also um, for a little bit, but mostly narcotics. That was, it was really that, that's how uh, my time in Seattle, narcotics. And that's when, actually, that's when I started working money laundering as well. Okay. So um, it, this is a this is a real funny story. This is sort of like how you get haze when you're a new agent. But in the end, I, I got the better of it, I think. Um, so there was a, a senior agent, Gary Reese, at the airport, and he was known as a guy that liked you know to work money laundering cases. And so um, I was like, yeah, that looks interesting to me. Um, so working with him, I was able to uh, identify a group of individuals that were making structured deposits into all of the banks in Seattle. And all of a sudden, when the account got to about $30,000, the money would fly to the UAE. And it was consistent in all the banks. Um, started identifying all these individuals, Somalis, and um, looking into all of this, you know, into this whole group. Then I get information that they're trafficking, they're importing cot, which is, a, you know, it's a, a, a drug, it's a root that, that, you know, that has a very short, uh, uh, very short shelf life. But it's very popular within the Somali community. Um, it's a little bit, it's, it's a, a little bit like, uh, like heroin in terms of the, the effects, but it's very short lived. But it's caught. And so I would walk around the office and because I had this case and the Somalis and I was doing surveillance, people would meow. And I was like, really? Right? I was like, I'm trying to do my, this is what's happening. I was like, all right. So that was, you know, a little bit of my introduction to, uh, to, to being an agent. I was like, all right, cool. Fast forward. I'm, I'm sitting in the office. I get a phone call and it's an FBI agent from across the street. Um, guy by the name of Kepa Salazar. I never forget his name. He goes, uh, hey, you know, my name's Kepa Salazar with the FBI. I'm like, hey, dude, how's it going? He goes, um, I want to talk to you about, about your, your cop case. And I'm like, great. Now they got other agencies busted my child. I'm like, come on, dude. He goes, um, you ever heard of a guy named Osama bin Laden? No. It's 1998. Well, he goes, all right, I'm going to go across the street. I'll, we'll, have, we'll, we'll have a cup of coffee in the chat. Well, turns out all of that money was going to him. Wow. So on 9-12, that case became the most important case for U.S. Customs in Seattle. Wow. 30-something. All of a sudden, I had left the office by that time. Yeah. And all of a sudden, my phone blows up because I'm getting all of these alerts from techs. Because everybody's looking at my records. Everybody's looking at my cases, my ROIs. And I, I'm like, what the hell is going on? 
And then all of a sudden I see on the news, they did 10, 15 search warrants on all my locations, which by the way, after I left, I was like, look, somebody needs to take that case. And they were like, ah, it's, it's a cop case. They closed. Oh, wow. Man, that's really, that's, <laughs> that's really fascinating. <laughs> Who would have thought, right? I mean, just some cop case. So let me ask you, in the, in, when you're 23 years old working on narcotics, <clears throat> you ever do, are you doing undercover at that point? Towards the, yeah, towards the end of my career in Seattle, yes. So how is that? As a young kid getting thrown into undercover, what's your thought process about that? It was it was pretty interesting. Look, it's 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 uh, it's a little scary. Obviously, the first time you do it for real, right? So we go through through uh, through another cover certification process, and you get a, a psychological evaluation, and you know you go through all of this stuff. Um, and so. So it is. I mean, it's it's that first time. It's it's scary, but it's also exhilarating. Yeah. And you're also like, oh, wait a minute. This this is not this is not bad. And actually, after I started doing, I did some undercover work in Seattle. I started, you know, a little bit there. But then, when I left Seattle, the reason I left Seattle is because New York was looking for an undercover. Oh, okay. And so then I went from being kind of like a rookie undercover to running, to being the primary undercover in like a major, uh, in a major money laundering investigation in New York. And that was just like, all right, congratulations. Here you go. So you get to, you get to essentially go back home. You're, you're in there. Is any, uh, are you having any close calls and any undercover stuff that you're doing? So, um, so the first thing is, right to how I told you I grew up in Jackson Heights. Yeah. Well, that's where most of my undercover work happened. <laughs> so I had to, and my mother still lives in Jackson Heights to this day, still lives in Jackson Heights. Um, so I had to alter my behavior a little bit in terms of, you know, letting my mom know, like, look, I, I can't go visit, or if I go visit, I got to go straight into the garage. I can't go out. I can't be seen because that's now where I'm working. Mm. Um, so, you know, that, that was probably the, you know, the, you know, the first thing, not necessarily close calls there, but there was, you know, there was one or two close calls when I would travel. Um, there was a time in, in, in Puerto Rico where, you know, I'm standing waiting for the bad guy and I'm with my backup agent and she looks and she goes, Hey, that van just opened the door and they're, you know, they're like circling us. And it's full of dudes that look like they don't, they're not very happy. So I was like, hmm. So we stood there. As soon as I made eye contact with one, I got in a car. We pulled out of where we were. And then all of a sudden, they start forming in behind us. So we're in, in San Juan. I'm trying to lose them in, like, in traffic. So I'm trying to like play with the lights. Um, and uh, eventually, we were able to make it into a mall parking lot. We got far enough ahead, we were able to dump the car. And then we ran into the mall, called our backup team and said, okay, this is where we are. You guys need to get us. And you guys need to get here quick. Uh, but luckily, that, you know, that, that was the exception. It wasn't the rule. Yeah. So the undercover that you were doing at the time, did it, they obviously had money laundering. Is that... Predominantly for narcotics cases. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you know, I would stand on a corner in in you know in New York City, and all of a sudden, magically, half a million dollars would appear. <laughs> they were like, "Here!" And I'm like, "Oh, well, thank you very much." <laughs> so much like much like other federal federal agencies, FBI, DEA, uh, mm-hmm. Homeland Security, or or Customs. Um, has offices overseas. Mm-hmm. And at some point, you end up as the assistant attache in Bogota. Uh, what brought you there? What, 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 was the, uh, what was the enthusiasm of going there? Well, so the, the case where I was the primary undercover grew. Um, and we had, a, uh, we had a really very well-placed source who was in Colombia who said, look, I have all of these people that I'm meeting with, all of these brokers, all of these members of these organizations, all of these money launderers, I meet with them on a regular basis here. It was 
you guys, do you guys want them? Because they're here, I'm here. Because look, if you follow me around for for the day, you will identify every single person who's responsible for all of that money. And you'll be able to, you know, look at all those, you know, identify all those organizations. So we were thinking about, yeah, I mean, that would be a great way to do it. You know, a couple of, you know, a couple of hurdles. U.S. Customs had an office in Bogota, but it was small. We didn't have a lot of resources. DEA had had, you know, had a bigger office. Um, and somehow we bamboozled DEA. <laughs> this is great. We bamboozled DEA into letting us use a vetting unit that they thought were the bad news bears. So they were like, oh, in their eyes, they would, they would give us the bad news bears and we would fail. And then DEA would be like, see, you can't do this. Right? So they give us this unit. And I was born in Cologne. So my supervisor comes to me and goes, do you want to go to Colombia and like hang out with all these Colombians and see if we can make a case? I'm like, hell yeah, let's go. So I went from being the primary undercover agent in New York to being the cold case agent in Bogota, mm. running with this unit. So running, you know, surveillances with this unit, uh, doing uh, telephone intercepts, just running the whole case. Um, I was there probably about six or eight months in the middle of that 9-11 happened. So when 9-11 happened, I had, I had flown back September, 10, September 8th, flew back September 8th, 2001 from Bogota with all my evidence because I had a, I had a meeting on the morning of September 11th at the U.S. Attorney's Office to begin to draft indictments for all of these money brokers in Colombia, right? Once 9-11 happened, so during 9-11, I was in the, I was, I was, I had arrived at the, at the World Trade Center at like five in the morning because I needed to get prepared for my 8.30 meeting at the U.S. Attorney's Office. So I got, I had all, you know, everything. I had evidence, you know, all of that stuff with me in the building I-9-11 when, you know, all hell broke loose at 9 o'clock. You were in the building? when I was I... in the building. Holy crap. I was the last person to turn on the lights on our floor on 9 11 What floor were you on? Sixth floor. It's got to just be surreal. Yeah. Holy crap. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, that, that was... Um, I thought I was going to the U.S. Attorney's office. You know, I remember even, you know, we saw the, 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 like the fire after the first plane hit. But on our side of the building, all we could see was the reflection of a fire. We didn't see any debris or anything. So we were just hanging out there like, oh, man, look, you, you know, we thought it was uh, um, the Port Authority had a cafeteria on the 46th floor that we used to go to all the time. And we we're like, oh, man, can't go for lunch. You know, we're not going to be able to go to lunch there for a while because, look. It was like a gas fire or something. Like something happened at the cafeteria. Like that was that's what was in our minds. Um, and then later on, one of our ASACs came out and let us know in no uncertain terms that we needed to get out of the building. So I, I'm assuming you had plenty of time. Nobody was lost. In- yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So this this whole thing happens, right? So 9-11 happens. Yeah. And now we still have this case. We still have a lot of evidence. Um and we re we re uh, we regrouped at JFK on probably September thirteenth or something. And the deputy sack at the time um, came up to me and she said, "Listen, I know you're just you're supposed to just be here for a couple of days um, because of you know you came up for the case and for the indictments." She was like, "Look, if you don't want to go back, you don't have to. Just you know." Just let me know. Um, and I said, look, um, let me just figure out sort of what's going on here and how long I need to stay. I said, well, we're going to finish this case. I said, we are going to, <laughs> this is not going to stop. So we're, we are going to bring these people in mm. uh, and we're going to finish this case. And so I stayed a couple of weeks and then I did. Work. And then that case ended up being the very first time that 
the government of Colombia had approved the extradition of, we had seven money brokers, but nobody was charged with trafficking drugs. Everybody was charged with money. And that was the very first time that Colombia had approved an extradition based solely on money laundering charges. Wow. That's pretty impressive then. And in the end, DEA was pretty upset. (laughs) (laughs) And and look, in the world of in the world of, of, of agency rivalries, whenever I can upset the EA, it's a good thing. Because <laughs> it means I did good. <laughs> it's 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 their way of saying great job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you, as an assistant attache in Bogota for HSI, is that a promotion? That was a promotion. Okay, so you is that a 14 then, yeah. I'm assuming? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about this. Because at some point, and I'm assuming it's right about here, you decide to take the management route. Um, what, what's your thought process? Why do you want to go management instead of, you know, continuing to work cases? I think there's a couple of different, couple of different, um, couple of different sort of um, things went into that. Um, number one, um, I love to follow the rules, but I also love to innovate. And so it's, and I also like the responsibility of figuring out how do we do it better. Like I thrive on that. Um, so that was part of it. So I was like, well, I know what we're doing, but we've been doing this for a long time. It's like, what, what can we do different? Um, after being in, in, in Bogota and seeing the potential that, you know, the, 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 the relationship that I have built with, with, the, with the local uh, cops, seeing the potential that that had for us as an agency, right? Really, my vision was like, wow, like we can step up and actually do, achieve our full potential, right? Um, and really be good partners, right? Because there, there isn't, there aren't enough of us collectively in law enforcement to do the job, right? And so the way I looked at it was also by saying, look, working, you know, in coordination with, we can do twice as much collectively, right? With all, you know, with sort of a, everybody who was sort of like all the partners. Um, but, you know, the, the, the funny story was um, it was... I was a 13 agent. I was a primary on the cover. I was in New York. I was young. It was like 7:30 at night, and I had all of these reports that I had to, you know, to write from all of these meetings and all of that. So I'm in the office, right? So you know, it's you're, it's the, it's 7:30 at night, and you're in the office. You start walking around going, I can't be the only person here. So I'm walking around trying to find a, you know, like another soul, and I come across my ASAC. So. He's a New York legend, a man by the name of Nelson Chen, half Puerto Rican, half Chinese. Best undercover in the world, right? So he's done the job, the fantastic boss. You know, one of these guys that you would do whatever, you know, whatever they, they, they needed to do, you wanted to do it as best as you could. So he was in the office. I said, so, I, and, I, and I walked in like, Dude, what are you doing here? I was like, I know what I'm doing here. I'm, you know, what are you doing here? And he was in the middle of doing some stuff with our undercover operation. You know, paperwork. Because these operations are paperwork intensive. And he was like, ah, this operation. And I was like, it's like, really? To be here at 7 30? He goes, oh, you know, this is, you know. He goes, you know what? Enjoy. You've got the best job in the world. Your life for you will never get better. This is it. You're living it. He goes, un- un- enjoy it. You know, what do you mean? He goes, you're at 13. Nobody bothers you. Your word carries weight. People follow what you say, right? It's great. He goes, and you're responsible for yourself. He goes, it's the best position in the world. So me being a smart ass, right? I'm like, well, why did you become a boss? So takes his glasses, puts them in his hand, looks at me, and he goes, because it's better to be the asshole than to work for the asshole. Fair enough. So ultimately, why did I become a boss? Yeah. Because I would just much rather be the asshole. 
So I think I know the answer to this question, but you're you're the you're the sack right now, right? <clears throat> so when you decided to go into management, did you have any did you have any aspirations? And the reason I ask this is I had at least one guy in my academy class that never it wasn't about doing the job, it wasn't about arresting people. His whole goal was I want to be a sack one day. So I'm assuming based on your story and and wanting to make a difference and everything else, but just just the story that you just told, was there any aspiration of if I go into management, I am going to get to this level or you just wanted to make a difference? I just, yeah. As a matter of fact, I every time I've been selected for a promotion, I've told people, you don't want to do this. I've advised them against, including when I got my, my SCS and they made me the sack here. I said, look, you don't want to do this. You really don't. This is the worst thing that you could be doing for yourself, but that's fine. Um, I, I was able to play a little bit of a game um, when I became the deputy SAC because I could apply for the SAC announcement and I could make it to the interview. And I could just tag the interview and I'd be like, oh, well, I guess I'm just going to stay at the SAC. Um, but eventually they caught on and they were like, yeah, that's, we're on to you. That's not going to work anymore. Um, so I, I, I didn't, I had, I had no, no desire. I just wanted to make a difference really. I mean, I, I, I get, I get, um, personal satisfaction and job satisfaction from making a difference. Um, you know, becoming a sack was, I just wanted to be a GS-13. Back when I started, we competed for our GS-13s. That's what I thought I could ever be. Um, and yeah, no, I had no aspirations. So let me ask you this, John. I mean, besides being a senior 13, what, what job do you think you like the most? Well, this one. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, fair enough. Well, so let's talk about this. So you basically go from... Assistant attache to section chief in DC, ASAC in Miami, deputy SAC, and then now you're the SAC in Honolulu. So we talked about this a little bit beforehand. I find it, I actually find it really interesting the way HSI does this. I actually think it's kind of cool. Tell me your areas of responsibility as the SAC in Honolulu. So I oversee the state of Hawaii, um, all of the US territories, so Guam. CNMI, the uh, American Samoa. I also oversee all of the Kofa nations, which are the Marshall Islands, Palau, um, and uh, Micronesia. So all of the, I oversee all of the U.S. Pacific Islands and U.S. Pacific territories. Is there, before I talk to you about Hawaii in particular, are there specific cases in your area of responsibility that take not necessarily a higher priority, but are there um, cases that are more prevalent than others? This, this AR is interesting because the, because of the political alliances between the U S and some of these, you know, the, the, the territories and, and the Kofa nations, um, U.S. law applies in some respects and not others. Um, so it, it, it really challenges us to work together with those, um, with those uh, entities at, you know, Guam, CNMI, to try to really, to be able to exercise our authority, but complement it with the authority that we don't have. So for instance, in some places, we have immigration authority. In some places, we don't. In some places, we have customs authority. In some places, we don't. Um, so I think in terms of the, the, the challenges and, and the types of cases, they're very, very unique because the, the, the terrain is like no other AOR uh, within HSI. Right? You know, the, the, the political and legal um, differences that we deal with here don't exist in, you know, 
Miami or New York or any other place that, that's ever worked. Yeah, but I know that your your expertise, if I could say that you've got expertise, is in money laundering. Is is that pretty prevalent in your area of responsibility? Is, is money laundering a big thing, no matter what country you're, or what what area you're in? Yeah, the the, the big difference here um, is the level of sophistication. Mm. So the type of money laundering work that I did when I was an undercover in New York was lots of volume, very little sophistication. Um, it was cash, get the cash, give me the cash, get the cash into the, into the, into the financial system, get the, you know, and get the money out. Um, here, we're dealing with a completely different adversary. And the primary uh, adversary that we're dealing with here is money coming into the state of Hawaii from uh, the proceeds of criminal activity in other in other countries, and we have a lot of enemy nations in this general area. So Chinese on the ground banking is a significant threat here, and the level of sophistication involved with that uh, is very, very, very different from narcotics trafficking. Um, because we're, we're talking about not just organized crime, but we're also talking about um, high-level political corruption. And so both the volume and the sophistication level on that type of crime is, is quite high. Why are they targeting Hawaii in particular? I don't know that they're targeting. I think it really is more of an affinity just because we're in the Pacific. Yeah. So it ha- it's not necessarily that they're Targeting is just that this, you know, the state of Hawaii and before then the kingdom of Hawaii has been a uh, a significant player in the Pacific and in Asia through immigration. So, you know, when the kingdom of Hawaii uh, needed workers for the fields, they all came from Asia. So mm-hmm. there's so there's a lot of cultural affinity um, between. Asia and and the Pacific, uh, dating back to to the you know to the time of the king. Got it. So I listened to an interview that you did with one of the reporters here, and they were talking about game rooms. Can you talk about what game rooms are? Because if you're if you're from the mainland, you have no idea. And what are the dangers here of these game rooms on Hawaii? So all gambling is illegal in the state of Hawaii, and um, that would be well and good, except that. You have a population that has an affinity for game, for gambling. Um, Las Vegas is called the Ninth Island. If you cannot find a Hawaiian in Hawaii, look for them in Vegas because that's probably where they are. Wow. Um, there's there's a very you know a direct connection between Hawaiians and and and, and, and Las Vegas. Um, I think Las Vegas has the largest number of Hawaiians not in Hawaii in the U.S. Something like that. Um, and so these game rooms are, think back to, you know, the 1930s where you have these, you know, organized crime sets up these places where people can, uh, they have table casino gambling, but most of them are these video game machines. Mm. Um, and they are pretty prevalent here, on, especially on the island of Oklahoma. They are uh, the, I call it the belly button of crime. That's where drugs are sold. That's where guns are sold. That's where humans are sold. Because it's, it, it's a place where all of the bad guys get together. It's an illegal place. They gamble. They drink. And they you know, conduct their, their deals. And so we have been working over the last couple of years very closely with, with uh, Honolulu Police Department targeting and starting to get a, a feel for these games. So we estimate that there are probably well over 100 of these game rooms on Oahu alone. In terms of money, the thing is every dozen of these uh, video game machines is a million dollars a year. Oh. And a game room can have 60 or 70 of these machines, times over 100. So it's, it's a huge um, 
source of revenue for criminal organizations in Milwaukee. What type of criminal organizations are running these uh, are running these game rooms, and where does the money go? Is is it going to different countries? Some of the money is you know leaving overseas. Some of the money is actually staying here. Okay, um, but there's it, it, it's also become a place where um, organized crime collaborates. So you'll have Chinese organized crime, Vietnamese organized crime, um, South Pacific organized crime taking different roles in these game rooms. One will be the, will own the game room. Another organization will run it. Another organization will provide security. And as they get, uh, as they get bigger or as they gain clout, then they will move on. And it's sort of, you know, they'll be promoted. Yeah. <laughs> or, They'll start their own, right? But it's all and and it's um, it's generally peaceful between them. Although you know we have seen an uptick in stickups and robberies and beatings and you know violence associated um, with these game rooms. How is it uh, as a federal agent in Hawaii? Uh, obviously, I've talked to a couple other Honolulu uh, police officers. Um, how is it being a federal agent on Hawaii? Do you see a difference in the way people view law enforcement as opposed to New York or Seattle or Miami, where you've served before? I don't know that that people necessarily view you different. I think one of one of the things coming here, which is much different from anywhere else, is everything that happened here didn't happen that long ago. In other words, you really have to be cognizant and sensitive to the history of what happened. Here. You know, what happened to the people before? Yeah. You have to know those questions. Um, you have to be sensitive to that because it does impact. People look at your behavior, your knowledge of some of these historical facts, and then they will say, you know, they will they will see whether or not you know what you're talking about or you're ignoring something which is, you know, very important, right? Because uh, it's a very welcoming culture. Like, I've never felt unwelcome here. Um, and which probably why, you know, it, it, I, I, I got here and I fell in love with the place. Within a week, I was like, I don't want to go here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the... the Culturally, this place, the richness of the Hawaiian culture is something that people will look to see whether you as a federal agent coming from the mainland, not being from here, whether you have knowledge and, and how sensitive you are. To them. Uh, and once they, they see that you're knowledgeable and you're sensitive, then at that point, you know, it, it really is not um, that much different in terms of how, you know, how you're viewed. I, I, I guess my question was more of this, which is, as you said, they're very welcoming. It's a very family-oriented culture. Um, you see blue lights in certain areas. And I was just wondering if you saw a level of respect for law enforcement that you don't see in other areas that you've served before. Yeah, I, I think... I think that they, 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 I don't know if I don't know if it's necessarily a, like a different level of respect, but but there is you know there is a level of appreciation. Yeah. Um, I think the the other thing that is very different here from everywhere else is the way law enforcement gets along. Hmm. So the law enforcement community here is as is is it's it's as tight as I've ever seen. So there is no, look, you know, we, we joke about rivalries between agencies and everything else. Right. Here, you know, we'll joke, but, but there is no discontent. You know, we're adults. We're human. We're going to have disagreements. But here, every conversation is like, okay, we're going to get, we're going to find the middle ground. Yeah. Nobody ever gets off from the table and walks in and says, well, we're not going to work with you. It's like, oh, like, all right. We're going to fight. 
we will find a way to do this. Yeah. Uh, there's a willingness, you know, it's sort of the spirit of Aloha, right? Yeah. Where, and so that that is the that is absolutely different mm. here from everywhere else. Um, the way we get along with each other, the way we collaborate, uh, the way we you know we we come together when we need to, and we assume leadership roles when we have to, and fall back and just support when that's the role that is needed. So I think um, part of that, I think, is because the agencies here are grossly understaffed. So there's really nobody on this island that can say, well, I don't need you. No, we don't, we need each other. Right. Um, so I think those deficiencies in, in, in resources, we make up for those deficiencies by being collegial with one another collaborating, working together, and finding those ways to, you know, to succeed. Which almost, uh, in a way, because agencies are shorthanded, it almost works out better for everybody. It does. I, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think uh, in terms of stats, if everybody had more numbers, obviously, you know, there would be more, more you know, the stats would grow. But it would be, you know, is the growth in stats worth sort of the the decay in sort of the civil and collegiate order that we have as law enforcement here? And it's it's sort of a a, a tough thing to balance out. Yeah, John. A couple last questions for you. Um, first of all, I know in this day and age, law enforcement struggling with recruiting and everything else. If somebody is watching this video and wants to become an HSI agent, what qualities do you look for in particular as a SAC? And what would you tell somebody that was interested in going into HSI? Intellectually curious. Um, willing. Uh, not doing it for yourself. This is not a job that any of us do for ourselves. Um, we all sort of start for, for different reasons. Uh, but in the end, it's all it's all done for for the greater good. So I think somebody who is um, dedicated, intellectually curious, uh, that wants to make a difference, and that is ready to lead. I think that's the one the one quality with with HSI, and it was something that we sort of brought over from for me was customs. Um, it might be your first thing on the job, but if it's your case, you're the boss. And we expect you to be able to tell senior agents where you want them and what you want them to do. And the senior agents will let you put them, let you put them where you want them. As long as you don't, you're not, as long as you're not going to hurt yourself or hurt somebody else, they will allow you to make a mistake. And we all make plenty of mistakes. <laughs> and then when it doesn't work, they'll put their arm around you and say, yeah, that was built from the beginning. But now you know. Yeah. Now you know how not to do it. Yeah. Now let's talk about how to do it. Let me ask you about your HSI career. I, I'm mm -hmm. curious about this. You obviously have an expertise in money laundering. If somebody comes into HSI, one thing that I find very interesting and kind of a cool thing about HSI is I can work on an artifacts case or I can work on a counterfix case or I can work on narcotics case. Did you ever find yourself as pigeonholed in one area? Are you able to come into HSI and go, okay, and, and maybe you find a calling, maybe you go counterfeit work or maybe it's whatever else, but maybe you come in, you start working on counterfeit, you go, hey, I want to try this. Did you ever find yourself pigeonholed and how do you think HSI deals with that? So I, I never found myself myself pigeonholed just because I, I I really once I started working money I was like I love this this is fun um, but no we allow our personnel to be productive throughout their life that's another thing that you know we have a, a within our agency you can you can be a productive agent and still have a productive home. You could still coach Little League. You could still 
you know, be at the recitals for your daughter. You can, you know, do all of these things while still carrying significant cases because not everything that we work runs at the same tempo. So what you will see um, agents do is come out of the academy when they're young and full of energy and they're single and they have no commitments, right? So those are the guys that are doing all the drug work. They do drugs, drugs, drugs. In the middle of that, they're going to meet a person who knocks them off their feet and all of a sudden, now this agent is about to be married, right? Uh, and so they meet their husband, they meet their wife, and that they enter sort of the next phase of their career, and then they'll be like, okay, now they're going to have children, and so maybe then go into work, which is in, 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 in fraud or, or in intellectual property, where there is, you know, you're not going to have those 11 o'clock you know, meetings that you're going to have to cover as part of a surveillance because your targets are asleep by 8.30 at night anyway. Um, and so the career, the job allows you to maintain a high level of uh, production as, a, as, a, as an investigator while being able to meet obligations at home. Um, and I think because we cover so, we do so much, I think we have, about 15 or 16 different investigative disciplines that that we cover in our in in our uh, in our portfolio um and yes folks can say okay you know i i don't want to do drug work anymore i want something a little bit different a little bit more challenging it also helps um as people become more senior and they have you know they they have experience um they become more experienced and in, in, in more analytical than so then those are the those are the persons that you need working the strategic investigations looking at arms trafficking and, and these types of stuff or they become uh computer forensic agents right and then do that type of work um you know sort of the, to really complement what happens in their everyday life. So it's actually one of our selling points. You, know, you talk about, you know, what, what do we want in, in somebody who's going to become an HSI special agent? Yeah, we want that commitment, but we also want to let them know that you will have an opportunity to remain productive as a, as a professional, and fulfilled as a professional, while at the same time being able to carry out at, you know that that timing as a as a husband, as a wife, as a father, mom, and 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 take care of all that as well. So, which is interesting because one of the questions I always ask, and I think I'm going to know the answer based on what you just said, is did did being in law enforcement affect your family? Yeah, and and, and in what way? They're in it with you. Yeah, you know they they're they're, they're in it with you. I, I think. Uh, it impacts it impacts your your family in, in all sorts of ways. Whether it's just like you know all the travel that that you know that has to be done um, because of the work, there is a lot that is going to fall on your spouse that they're going to have to do because they're not there. Um, so you know, and and it also with with your kids um, because they know what you do. Um, but there's always that, that point in time when they start to realize what you do and they start to think about what you do and they get scared because of what you do. Uh, and so, you know, just noticing how you're dressed when you leave the house, and that has an impact on your family. Mm. Something that simple to us, it means nothing. But I, I think, oh, you know, if they see us, like, oh, I know he's going to testify in court, he's wearing a suit, all right, he'll be fine. All of a sudden, you're leaving and you got, you know, your BDUs on. And it's like, uh, it's that kind of a day. So, yeah, I mean, it, it impacts your family. That's interesting. I never, I never really thought about that, that dress thing, which I think you're 100% right. Okay, well, last question for you, John. If you can go back, think about growing up in Jackson Heights till now, has being in law enforcement 
affected the way that you see people in society? I think it's made me more empathetic. Uh, um, it's more and more there by the grace of God will I. Because like I said, when I was growing up, if you would have met me when I was 14, 15 years old, you're like, oh yeah, that's a doing all the women. Absolutely. Um, and that, that's not lost. And a um, uh, little bit with how you're, you know, how you're raised or your values. Um, and then if I look at my life, look, a couple of breaks here and there um, could have been the change. And, and, and I don't know that, that, that I'm that different from anybody else. So that's how it's, it's made me more empathetic. And, 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 it, and it's also allowed me the opportunity to actually have these conversations with people that are in a lot of trouble. Um, and get to know them in a different way, right? So it's not just a scary bad guy on television. I'm actually sitting in a room with them and giving them something to drink and taking them out so they can have a smoke and relax a little bit so they can feel better. Where do you think that comes from, though? Do you think it just comes from experience over time dealing with people? Do you think that goes back to the way your mom raised you? And where do you think that comes from? I, I think it comes from being realistic about... Um, about how fragile everything is, right? That it's, you know, yes, we, you know, we're born and we're on a certain path, but we all make these decisions and not every bad decision is made by a bad person. Um, a lot of it may be differences in opportunities, differences in, in, in the way you know, that, that people are brought up, you know, lots of different things sort of go into that. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, to their situation. It doesn't mean I am sympathetic to all of the bad things that they did. And I think it's being able to separate that to say, look, this is terrible. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've had the situation too, where you have somebody who you work a case and they're doing 10 years in prison and they send you a thing to them. How do you explain that? I put, I, I ruined your life. They're like, no, you saved my life. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, after you get a couple of those and you, you have a couple of those conversations, I don't know that, that there's any other way to see the world other than to say, look, you know, let me just make sure that I'm thankful for the decisions I've made and sort of the way things have rolled out for me. But um, maybe I could have been in the same shoes if a couple of things had gone different in my life. Yeah, very true. John, thank you very much for the interview. I appreciate right. it.